Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the second technical conference for this year's rulemakings for chapters 15, 25, 26, 27, and 29. My name is Travis Whedon and Dan Boyle, Dan Boyle across from me, um, and I are the attorneys for the Petroleum Storage Tank Division. At the table with me are several members of the Petroleum Storage Tank Division, including Robin Strickland to my right, uh, the director of the division, and representatives from PSD's administrative, technical, and compliance departments. If you haven't already, please sign in at the lectern uh, uh, near the door. There are no copies of the revised proposed rules uh, printed today, but they will be shown on the screens uh, if you didn't bring your own copies. Also, the rules are available online at the Commission's website, www.occeweb.com. Under the tab for conducting business, click on proposed rules. After today, there will be a public hearing for the commissioners to consider and hopefully vote to adopt the revised proposed rules on Tuesday, December 10th, a week from today, at 9.30 a.m., and that hearing will be here as well in courtroom 301. Uh, we encourage you to join us for that hearing as well. Uh, Commissioner Murphy is with us today. Uh, we'll note that this is a regular meeting, and notice was posted at 10.30 a.m. on November 26th. Uh, Commissioner Murphy, is there anything you'd like to add before we begin discussing the revised proposed rules? Okay, with uh, introductory matters attended to, we'll jump right into discussion and comments on the revised proposed rules, starting with Chapter 15. So the way I'll do it is I'll go over any highlighted changes that were made uh, since the, uh, the, the proposed rules were filed around the time of the NOPERS, uh, and then I will go through any comments that were made in each chapter. There has been one change uh, since the NOPERS and proposed rules were filed, and it is highlighted on page one of the revised proposed rules sent out by GovDelivery. Now, that revision to the current proposed rule is in the definition for AST. The statute reference is 30327, and that is a typo. The correct subpart is 40. And that is the only change to Chapter 15. And next, let's move on to comments filed. One party filed comments on two of the Chapter 15 proposed rules on November 15th. The first comment is regarding Rule 15-1-2 on pages 1 and also on page 4 uh, concerning the definitions for AST and UST and suggested that these definitions should be changed in statute and rules to match EPA's definitions. The commenter also suggests that we include other definitions from EPA regarding the terms dispenser, dispenser system, and replaced. The commenter also suggests that we are adding uh, new definitions to the rules, uh, and the division has responded uh, that they revised the definitions to not repeat the already statutorily defined definition for storage tank and storage tank system, and have not added new language to the definitions already in rule and statute. After considering the comment, the division believes it must keep the language as is in the proposed rule. PSD will continue to look at the EPA definitions to determine if any should be included in future rulemakings. The second comment was filed stating that several changes are being made to the color coding requirements in Rule 15-13-1, uh, which is on page 5. Uh, that are not in, the changes that are being made that are not in accordance with the API 1637 standard uh, used nationwide, and that there's no need to mandate unique color coding specific to Oklahoma. PSD responded that the only change to the color coding rule this year is adding coding for EF, E15 tanks, uh, which we are predicting may become more prominent in the future. Uh, after considering the comment, PSD believes that it should keep the language in the rule as proposed and not adopt uh, the API standard at this point because tank owners would then be required to change their tanks uh, to the API color coding uh, when they are already in compliance with the rule as is. At this point, th those were the two comments for Chapter 15. So at this point, I'll open the floor for any comments anyone has on the revised proposed rules for Chapter 15. Uh, hearing none, let's move on. Oh. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> Come on up. And, and please state your name. State my name. Okay. My name is uh, Kevin Nickel. I'm with Love's Travel Stops. And the one that I probably have some, some concerns about is on page 7. Oh, my bad. Okay. On page 7, section D there. It's highlighted in red, the vent risers must be located, protected, and anchored 
to prevent damage from traffic, wind, or testing procedures. So the way that reads right there, the way I look at that is that not only does it have to be located somewhere, but you also have to bollard it and anchor it. So if it's already out of the traffic zone, it's already away from everything, and it's already anchored, why does it need to be protected? If it's behind a building and up against a building, then it's already located out of the, six, out of the way. The way I would say that this would probably need to be presented would be vent risers must be anchored and located or protected to pre prevent damage from traffic wind or testing procedures. And Mr. Nickel, can I just, this isn't in chapter 15, is it? Yeah. Page seven. Oh, page five. I have the color coding requirements on page five. Oh, my bad. I may be on the wrong one. What what number rule is it? It should say chapter 15 here, and then it's 25-2-55. Uh, yeah. Am I in the it, wrong place? It's, it's in chapter 25. My bad. And and, it's okay. It's I will, set up here ch chapter 15, so I was like, oh, okay, so I'm here. I think you probably are looking at either response to comments or deserve yeah. comments, and they're all in one document. They're all in one document. But I'm just going chapter by chapter. My bad. But uh, we can discuss that one right now if you'd like. That'd be uh, great. I'm already up here. <laughs> well, I know that with the – so is that the collision barrier rule or the vent pipe? The vent piping requirement. The vent piping requirement. Yes, sir. Yeah. Let's see if I can find that. Okay. So that was our fifth comment on Chapter 25. Is that Rule 25-2-55.2? Yes, sir. On page 10 uh, concern, concerning vent piping requirements. Page 10 of the revised proposal okay. rules, not that. Um what we said to that was or the comments are suggested uh, proposed changes should not apply to existing tank systems as the relocation or installation of bollards may have a cost impact on some owners. The commenters suggested that bollards be replaced and added if steel riser is knocked over by a vehicle, in addition to also your comments, Mr. Nickel. But uh, PSC responded to those comments, uh, the written comments, that this is added language. is not It's not a new requirement this year. It's already adopted in the rules. It's an industry standard from PEI and the API, that, that language but that's in there. But it's not in PEI. We have the... I don't believe it says it just like that, because the way that states is that I'm, I'm having to locate it and protect it and anchor it. I have that it's in PEI 110.12 and API 1615 13.3. So if I but I know with what you're talking about, like the back of the building. I think Justin didn't didn't you guys uh, speak about this? Yeah, I'd answer this question for another person who brought this up. Okay, and the way we're wanting to enforce this is if you've got well, we got a ton of locations got vent lines that are connected to the back of the building that are not exposed to traffic. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be asking you to do anything with those. I, I understand that, but that's how the rule states that I have to protect it. Vent lines must be located, located protected, protected, and anchored. So essentially, you could basically throw an and in between each one. So you're, think, you're, you're just wanting to change the verbiage so that, that we clarify that. Correct. That, that the vent lines that are located. Where if they're, they're not, located, where they they're don't need to be protected. In, whether they're not in um, a traffic zone. In harm's way by traffic. Correct. Then it won't be. Uh, so would you be suggesting that if you put the word or instead of and, would that work? I would say you would flip it around and you would say that. That you located would, everything has to be anchored. Located or protected and anchored. Yeah, but you could start off by just saying it's anchored and or protected, uh, located or or protected. And PEI is saying freestanding vent installations should be capable of supporting themselves with respect to normal loads imposed by wind and testing procedures. Um, yeah, I mean, the intent of this rule is, is so, so if, that, if that would make it to where... I, I, I have no would, pr problem with it. It's just that now the way I'm reading it, I look at it and go, I got to do this, this, and this. Right. Mm. Vent risers must be located or protected. Uh-huh. 
and anchored to prevent damage from traffic. Bingo. Sorry well, I jumped ahead there, guys. That's okay. Uh, located, protected, and or anchored, right? No, no the, they're going to have to be They're always going to be anchored. Exactly. They're always going to be anchored. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And API says located or protected and anchored. Yeah. So. So we'll make a so the word or needs to, to be to, okay. okay to your suggestion. Thank you. Does that work? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nickel. Any other comments on Chapter 15? Let's move forward to Chapter 25, Underground Storage Tanks. Uh, again, there have been some changes since the NOPERS and proposed rules were filed, and I'll go through those first. Uh, they are highlighted in the revised proposed rules. On page two in the definition section, the definition for gathering lines was revised to match language in chapter 45. On page four, also in the definition section, the definition for USC system was revised to say delivery truck instead of transport truck. And this revision was made to match the statutory language. Still on page four at rule 25-1-41, we have added the word online to clarify what type of PSD format should be used. Uh, this change is also made in several places throughout the chapter, and I won't go back against that, but the pages four and six, four through six, nine, and 17 through 18, I won't mention it every time. Uh, and if you turn to rule 25-2-38 on page nine, we've added highlighted language regarding remote fill piping and its installation. And this highlighted language is added to clarify the rule uh, based on a comment that was received. So those are changes. And now for the comments that were filed on Chapter 25, uh, one party filed comments on five uh, Chapter 25 proposed rules on November 15th. The first comment is regarding Rule 25-1-11 uh, concerning the definitions for AST and UST, and as the same comment and would have the same response as was discussed in Chapter 15. Also with the comment on definitions on page 4, a comment was made concerning the definition for owner. The commenter was fine with the definition that matches the statutory definition, uh, the, the portion that matches the stat statutory definition, but asked why additional language was being added. PSC responded that there is no new additional language this year. The definition was amended to not repeat statutory language, and the additional language that is referenced is already in the rule currently. PSD added that, um, added that language in a different rulemaking to explain tank ownership as it relates to the property where the tank is located in his PSDD's interpretation of the statute. After considering the comment, the Petroleum Storage Tank Division believes keeping the language as is in the proposed rule is most in line with current statutory definitions. The second comment is regarding Rule 25-1-48 on tank and line tightness testing. Uh, the comment suggested that there are circumstances where our rule would be more stringent than EPA and that was not uh, PSC's intention with this uh, proposed rule. After considering the comment, the division agrees with the commenter and has withdrawn the rule from this rulemaking. So if you're looking at your revised proposed rule, and for Sarah, you're not going to find that rule in the revised proposed rules. The third comment is regarding Rule 25-2-38 on page 9 concerning fill pipe requirements. Uh, the commenter requested an opportunity to discuss the proposed change with staff, and PSC staff, uh, Justin Lankford, spoke with the commenter, and, and the added highlighted language was a result of the discussion. Uh, we believe commenter's concerns have been addressed there. The fourth comment is regarding Rule 25-2-55.1. Uh, on repairs to USD piping materials. Uh, the commenter suggests that there are discrepancies between the EPA requirements and the rule as it was proposed. And after considering the comment, the division agrees with the comment and has withdrawn the rule from this rulemaking so it can be further studied. And again, rule is not in the revised proposed rules because we have withdrawn it. And then the fifth comment was the vent piping requirements that we uh, went ahead and addressed for Mr. Nickel. 
So those were the, the comments for Chapter 25 and PSD response. At this point, I'll open the floor to any comments anyone has on the revised proposed rules for Chapter 25. move forward. Uh, hearing none, let's move forward to chapter 26, above ground storage tanks. And again, there have been some changes since the NOPERS and proposed rules were, fi were filed, and I'll go through those first. Uh, they are highlighted in, on the screens above in the revised proposed rules. And on page one in the definition section, uh, the definition for ASC system was revised to say delivery truck instead of transport truck. And that revision was made to match the statutory language uh, similar to uh, definitions in 25. On page five at rule 26-1-41, we've added the word online to clarify what type of PSC format should be used. And again, this is uh, making changes consistent with uh, chapter 25 as well. On page 8, at Rule 26-2-5.1, uh, we've made changes to the highlighted dates uh, since the revised proposed rules were filed. So what you're seeing there on the screen of July 15, 2000 is not going to be uh, what we've updated since then. So we made a change more recently than that. Uh, based on comments that were received, we're leaving the October 13, 2018 date in Part D of the rule. And we have changed the date in Part C to say before October 13, 2018. We made this change based on comment to ensure we aren't adding any more costs to tank owners with regard to overfill protection. In Appendix G, the field citation table on page 13, um, the word table was misspelled and it is uh, in the header there and it has been, the correction has been made there. So those were changes since the uh, proposed rules were filed uh, and should be in the revised proposed rules. Also, uh, one party filed comments on five of the Chapter 26 proposed rules on November 15th. Uh, the first comment is regarding Rule 26-1-2 uh, concerning the definition for change in service. The commenter stated that change in service concept in federal regulations allows changing from a regulated substance to a non-regulated substance and wants our rules to allow this as well. PSD responded that our revision to the change in service definition was solely grammatical to add the word or and is not intended to be substantive change. After considering the comment, the PSD believes keeping the language as is in the revised proposed rule is important for the protection of the environment. Also in the definitions, the same comment was made about the definition of AST that was previously discussed in chapters 15 and 25 and would also have the same response. The second comment in regarding, uh, is regarding Rule 26-1-48 on tank and line tightness testing. This is the same comment as was just discussed in Chapter 25 and has the same response in that PSD has withdrawn the rule from this rulemaking for further study of the rule and any consequences that may come from changing it. So again, the rule is no longer in your revised proposed rule. The third comment is regarding Rule 26-2-5.1 on page 8 concerning overfill prevention requirements. Uh, the and this is, is this what I discussed before in the changes, but the commenter suggested that changing the effective date to July 1st, 2007 in Part D would have a cost impact on some owners. PSD responded and agreed uh, with commenter and has decided to leave the date the same in Part D. However, there is still a need for the date in Part C to be consistent with Part D, and so that date has also been changed to state before October 13th, 2018. The fourth comment is regarding Rule 26-2-7 on collision barriers. Uh, the commenter does not want the added language to apply to existing tank systems, uh, stating it would cost owners to remove barriers and install them correctly by this rule. PSD responded that this language uh, is being added is an industry standard already adopted into the rules, and we are adding the language to make the rule more uh, easily accessible for owners. After considering the comment, PSD believes keeping the language as is in the proposed rule uh, because it's already adopted into rules uh, through the industry standard. 
Well, Travis, can I ask you on that? Does that mean that if you've already got it a different way, are you grandfathered in with that, or they're all going to have to change it to meet this? Are we going to give them a time, or what does that mean based on the comment? With the collision barriers? Well, current, I mean, currently what we're adding into the rule right now is already this, what they would need to meet, and it has been since the standard was adopted. Okay, so, so I can't tell if the commenter is making the point that the contractor – if some were installed that did not meet that as described, that means they were have been in violation of the rule just from the beginning, right? Yeah. Okay. So do we know if there's very many of those, or do we know? Justin, what are you seeing out in the field? Well, I mean, I don't have an exact number on that by, by any means. Um, like I say, the rules have been. Sure. They should be enforced up to this point. This shouldn't affect very many people. Okay, but I'm, I'm just asking, so if we find those, are we just are we working with them to give them some time to, even though we know what the rule should have been in place, but I'm also mindful of just what's going on in general with the economy and conditions absolutely. overall. Absolutely. As far as time to work right. with them, yes, absolutely. Okay, all right. Yeah. Thank you. And the fifth and final comment in Chapter 26 is regarding Rule 26-2-55 on repairs to underground piping materials. Uh, this is the same comment as was discussed in Chapter 25 and has the same response in that PSD has withdrawn the rule from the rulemaking for further study of the rule and the consequences from changing it. So you will no longer find that rule in your revised proposed rules. At this point, I'll open up the floor for any comments on the revised proposed rules for Chapter 26. At this point, I'll turn it over to Dan Boyle to discuss Chapter 27 and 29 proposed rules. Okay, keeping you awake for the last portion of uh, our technical conference, um, moving directly into Chapter 27, there have only been two changes since the last conference. Those can be found on page 4 of 4. And these are just consistent with changes that have been made in other parts of the rules. Uh, changing transport truck to delivery truck to be consistent with statute and chapters 26 and 25, and then also to include online as the format established uh, by PSTD is required, and that can be found in 16527-1-6. Those are the only changes that we've made. There have been no comments received regarding chapter 27. So there's nothing to respond to at this point. Uh, if there are any questions. I have a question. It relates to Chapter 25 as well. Oh, My name is Sheila Baber. I'm with Stantec. And I have a question that also relates to Chapter 25, but it's not dealing with the proposed changes. But I just wanted to bring it up because there has been some confusion discussed around our office recently about the definition of owner. And at the end of that definition, what it says right now is a real property owner who has a storage tank system located on their property that was taken out of service prior to November 8, 1984 is not considered to be a storage tank owner for any PSTD regulated purpose. And I suggest we might want to add, however, when tanks are closed or removed, all regulatory requirements would apply. To clarify that, because I don't see clarification in any other part of the rule or definition. So that's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else on Chapter 27? If not, we'll move on to Chapter 29. Um, there have been just a few changes to this chapter that are consistent with what has been done in the previous chapters as far as just minor changes. Uh, the first one can be found on page 13 of 16. That relates to, again, establishing online format. 
Again, you'll see another including up online on page 14 of 16. And then lastly, on page 16 of 16, again, the insertion of online as regarding the format. As with chapter 27, there were no comments filed on chapter 29. At this point, I'll open up for any other comments on chapter 29, or I guess at this point, any other comments. Travis, could you take me back to, um, I wasn't really sure I understood it, but it would be back in Chapter 15, and I'm looking at the, you, I know you touched upon it, but the comment that was made about the uh, color coding requirements and the comment, and tell me how the staff responded. I think this might tie into why I've been asked to meet about something. I think it's all making a little more sense to me. So can you go over that again? Sure. On Rule 15-13-1 on page 5 of the revised proposed rules is our general identification and color coding requirements for mm -hmm. the tank lids. And essentially this year we added a, a requirement for the E15 in anticipation, anticipation that it's going to be, I don't think, I mean, Jessica could respond, but I think there's maybe less than a handful that have an E15 tank now, but there wasn't a color requirement for it. And so that's all we did was add this here. The comment was that API has a, has a system for it that is used throughout the nation. Um, and while I don't know that there's anything necessarily wrong with the API color coding, I'm sure it would work just fine. But at this point, owners throughout the state have already painted it based on this rule. So it would mean like they're, they're regular unleaded, all of these other things they might have to change um, to the API color coding. And so um, the concern with that is that it would cost a lot more to change at this point to uh, API than for them to just, all we added to this rule this year was E15. So we, we didn't just, set up the whole. We just added a new one and so everybody one. else has already got the other color coding. That's so right. if somebody's asking me about wanting to ensure that pumps with over 10% ethanol are clearly identified to Oklahoma consumers. Would our rule meet that? On number eight right there, I think it that's was. It. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that actually that's... But a, an E15 would be also over, because it this says is, this is, over 10%, mm -hmm. not 10%. So it wouldn't over, is over 10% E15? An E10 wouldn't be over 10, right? But this rule that we're speaking of here is just color coding so that we don't drop the wrong fuel into the tanks. What you're, the, what you're concerned about is the uh, labeling of dispensers for the customer to see. Mm -hmm. This is for basically for the truck drivers to see that they're not dropping the wrong fuel. But so, so the rule that you're wanting to discuss is a separate rule from this. And I didn't say I wanted to. I'm saying people are calling me about it. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. Okay. So it's not like I picked out this topic. Right. Let's but have the, a discussion. Okay. The, the rule that you're you're that okay. It's it's <laughs> under dispenser labeling. Not this is on the tank lab, tank okay. fuel lid labeling. It's not a part of the pr proposed rulemaking this year. But it, but it just in general, if somebody's talking about fuel that's over 10% ethanol, that would necessarily be E15, right? If it's E10, it's not over 10%, right? We require labeling that says up to 10% ethanol um, on our labeling. And to give you the specifics on that rule, I would have to get, grab that rule and look at it for you. Sure, but you're either an E10, E15 means you're over 10 but under 15, up to 15. Is that what that means? Yes. Yes. It's kind of ranges is what I'm asking. Is that right? Well, You're trying the, to give them the maximum number of what it could be? Yes, our labeling on the dispensers, most generally what, what our labeling requires is that if you're selling ethanol, that it has to be labeled on there up to 10% ethanol. Okay. And then um, we haven't discussed, I don't think it says anything about E15 on there yet. On, on our, our, in on our consumers? Rules. Right. Okay, so why are we doing it for where the trucks drop it off, but we wouldn't do it for the consumer? Well, because there is, uh, there are, we should, I mean, there should be, it should be addressed, but it's just not in rule. It's not being, that rule's not open that I know of. I mean, I understand that, but it seems like I don't, why, I, I just don't understand why we wouldn't do corresponding things. I mean, maybe there's a reason for that, because I'm sure, I'm assuming the petroleum marketer folks have a little different opinion than the refiner folks. 
I'm assuming. They probably get along pretty well, except for a few areas is what I'm thinking. But it seems like if we're changing this, why, why would we not want it where the consumers could be able to spot that? Yeah, I need to look at the rule on the on the labeling so that I can answer your question properly. Okay, but I just want to make sure just fundamentally, just because this whole thing has triggered my confusion about the how it's done. The E10 is the maximum, it would be E10 or below. And then an E15 would be, it would be between 10, over 10, less, 15 or less. Is that right? Right. Okay, so it could be a 12, it could be a 13, but I'm assuming vehicles are just rated for whether they can take in the E15. Right, anything over 10% requires a vehicle that would be what they call flex fuel okay. that could take the up to 85% ethanol. Okay, because I think I learned something. I was thinking that E15 meant that it is E15, not that it could be 12 or 13 or 14. I didn't really understand that, so I guess I've learned something today. Yeah. And if it's a 10, what's the range to get it up to a 10? Is it a 5 to a less than 10, or what's... How do you get to a 10? Well, I mean, that's the reason range. our labeling does on, on ETN or less. If it has any ethanol in it, then the labeling that we require is up to 10% ethanol. So if I had any, if there was any ethanol in the gas, whether it was 10% or not, it has to have E10. It has to say up to 10%. But the label would be E10. The labeling on your dispenser would say up to 10%. So okay. it could be 5% or it could be up to 10% for a maximum. If it goes over 10%, then it would have to be labeled um, differently. It'd have up to, to the 15. It would then say flex fuel 85, uh, E85. Okay. I just want, you know, I, I think this is important for the trucks to know where to dispense things, but it seems like it's important for the customer to know how to fill up. Right. And that seems like it Most might be of our customers are concerned, am I buying 100% gasoline? Right. And, and if it is, um, um, or, am I, or am I buying product with ethanol in it? And so if you're, if you're uh, advertising 100% gasoline, then it has to be 100% gasoline. But if you've got any ethanol in it, up to 10%, it will say, it, the labeling has to be there to say contains up to 10% ethanol. But if I had a vehicle that was only rated for up to E10 and I put E15 in it, what happens? Yeah, it will, it's, we've got to have, it's, it's got, it can't be more than 10%, but I'm going to have, like I said, I really need to look at that rule and show you and, and discuss that with you. Okay, so right. I think this just triggered my thoughts about it when I looked at this and the comment and then that. And so it all just kind of congealed after we I've had time to kind of mm -hmm. think about it. So it just made me wonder if it's important to know where the truck drops the product so it's going it's got a color to make sure that the consumer's using the right dispenser for its fuel. Right. Okay. I agree. Okay. Thank you for your patience in me trying to understand this. I, th I think I learned a little more than I knew before. Thank and you. And I'll, I'll get the rule and, and, and go over it with you. Okay, great. Thank right. you. Thank you, Commissioner Murphy. Um, any other comments? Hi, I'm Terry Roberts with Oklahoma Environmental Services. And it's my understanding, right, that there are no more written comments accepted after this point, right? Those were due the 15th of November? That's correct. Okay, thank you. All right, well then verbally I'll just, um, I do want to uh, uh, mention a couple of general, make a couple of general statements. Um, one of the, I guess what I would tell you is, for instance, with our release detection program, we've got now up to close to 300 tank owners and probably about 700 tanks that we have on a method of release detection. And I would say that 90% of those customers only own one convenience store. And in Oklahoma, I don't think we're different than the statistics we're not that different than the statistics nationwide that will tell us that 50%, approximately 50%, and in some cases over 50% of owners 
own one convenience store. So my comment would be that I think that we are uh, obliged, as the EPA has done, because when they first proposed their rulemaking, that was in 2011. They came out with the final rulemaking in 2015. So it was a period of four years that they listened to, got comments from stakeholders, and had all of these discussions on what would be the appropriate final rulemaking. Certainly unique to underground storage tank systems. So I would just ask that we don't discount um, some of the comments that were made for OPMCA and certainly for uh, many of my customers are going to have potentially a significant economic impact. And when I say that, um, $1,000 or $2,000 can be very substantial for some of these people. So I would appreciate if you would consider and weigh the consequence of adopting something that is more stringent than what the EPA requires and has been able to justify through their rulemaking or regulatory process. Um, and I think there's something to be said for that and that uh, we should consider those things. Now, I would also make a general comment about these industry standards and codes. There are many. And in, uh, as I recall, it was Ms. Marla Peak with the Oklahoma Farm Bureau when I was still at the commission that brought up the idea that we don't just adopt industry standards and codes by reference, Pat, that uh, stakeholders are given an opportunity to discuss and as a result, Currently, in uh, the rules that we have today, uh, the Corporation Commission rules, it tells us that any substantive changes will be discussed. So uh, API 1637, I think on the staff's response to that comment on the color coding, was um, that those rules have been in place for years. Well, actually I went back and looked and that rule was that API 1637, which is a national code, was removed from the rules in 2016. So it's only been three years ago. Maybe part of this is that people don't realize until it happens that, hey, this is creating some problems. So rather than saying, Pat, across the board, it's in NFPA, it's in PEI, then I think that we do have the flexibility to determine whether or not we want to apply it or not apply it. And we can't discount it wholly because we think that it might be an issue for people to go out and I would venture to say two maybe three, and, and Justin can correct me, but as far as these tank labels, that's a universal application. It allows people to all be on the same page so there's no confusion, but there might be two or three different color codes that Oklahoma has adopted that aren't in an EPA. And we're talking about spray painting a tank lid. That's normally done on an annual basis anyway. So. That kind of change is not one that's going to have an economic impact. Do you understand where I'm going with that? It's not a major change. Why do we have to be different in Oklahoma? What is the justification? Um, so generally speaking, <laughs> let's make changes that make sense based on good science and threat to human health and environment and not just because you know, we think this would be good because there are sometimes some unintended consequences. And that's all I have. I think even though, I mean, 
I don't, I can't only speak for myself, but I think it would be helpful if you would, you know, the, the deadline is the deadline to help move things along, but the hearing on this isn't till December the 10th. So I would suggest that you put it in writing for the benefit of all the offices so that they can see what you're saying. So if you were just to kind of give it in looking at the comments, tell me specifically what you would be recommending be done. It's like wait on this or do something different. Help me understand exactly what it is you're wanting. Mm -hmm. Based, I've got the comments in front of me. So what are you saying that you want? Okay, well, for instance, um, from the uh, very first chapter, 15.1-2, the definition, where we uh, talk about the difference between the EPA's definitions of underground storage tanks, um, that the different, by having this different definition, that there can, in fact, be uh, unintended consequences with that, and what is the justification? And the example that was provided, Commissioner, was, for instance, you know, giving an example there would be to say, okay, if we adopt the Oklahoma definition, then we are specifically going to require that um, under dispensement under dispenser containment is added when the EPA has already looked at this and made the determination that no, just because you re replace a shear valve, you shouldn't have to install a containment sump. A containment sump, I don't know, gentlemen, you all know better than I, but that may be a seven or eight hundred dollar cost, right? $4. Well, $4. give me an idea, Chris. $4. $4. Okay, so what I'm, I'm saying by that, Commissioner, is that by changing our definition in Oklahoma different from the EPA's dis, uh, definition that has already been vetted and the, it, those examples are provided in the comments, then we add these additional costs for what might be a simple $100, $200 repair is now going to be a significant repair. Is, is the, that helps me a lot. Is the overall takeaway from your comments is that regardless of what the stack council voted on or whatever, that if there is movement to make the rules more strict than EPA rules, that there should be more discussion before it goes forward. Is that the main gist of what you're asking for? I absolutely agree with that statement. Well, I was trying to, I, I heard you say numerous things and I thought, am I taking away what she really said? So the underground storage tank would be one issue. The color coding is another issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yes, but in general terms, but if you're talking generally, and now you're giving me some specifics. Well, you asked for specifics. Right, right. But generally I speaking, what I guess what I am trying to say is exactly what you just said. If we want to be more stringent than what the federal government vetted over a period of four years, then let's justify that through good science, through something that makes sense. And I think that it's... Um, well, look at me. I'm standing here. I think a sump might be seven or eight hundred dollars, and they're telling me it's four thousand. So maybe those kind of changes warrant more conversation than what I know about, or what stack members know about, or the participation that we get in those meetings. Now, granted. <sighs> It's on the tank owner to show up and be here and talk about what's important to them. I would say in my position with 90% of those people that I gave you as an example that own one convenience store, not only are they not aware of the changes that are being made or the potential impacts of, that that could have them on them as individual owners, but also a lot of them aren't available. 
so they can submit written comments granted and and that's part of what uh opmca tries to do is do you, you know do you, are, do you think most of these owners are they um they get the postcards and are they do you all recommend that they sign up for gov delivery no i have not made that recommendation okay i i think that's an awesome idea it seems to me like, you know, with the system that we have, that it would be a better idea to expand the notice mm -hmm. and then, you know, to also just kind of highlight the things that are being changed. Because it's one thing to get gov delivery and you get all chapters and you're only concerned about one because you don't know what to sign up for. Mm -hmm. So we can just... It's almost like it can be too much information and then you don't even know what to look at. So it almost seems like they might want some guidance on what to sign up for because I know we've helped some pipeline people just from my office mm -hmm. kind of give them some guidance mm -hmm. on what to sign up for so they don't get all of these things they don't need. So you're here on behalf of Oklahoma Environmental Services in our capacity as far as the customers that we serve. Okay, and then you're supporting the comments on the two items that you've mentioned that have been filed by the Petroleum Marketers Association. I would support all of those comments that were made. And I think that some of the um, staff responses, um, it, it's also my understanding from my experience that if the rule is open, we have an opportunity to comment on it. Right. And I think some of the comments that OPMCA made, um, the rule was open. Those comments were made as to the appropriateness or, or what we may not have agreed with. And the a staff response was simply that that's not part of what we were proposing to change. So I don't think that really addresses the issue at hand. So would one suggestion be that maybe on these issues that you've raised is maybe there could be just another meeting, maybe a meeting with some of your, some of your clients or some of the petroleum marketer folks and the staff ahead of the December 10th meeting? Because it, it's it's really hard when these things come up and it comes up close to the to for me anyway the other commissioners can speak for themselves um, but it's hard for me when I you hear these things on the day of the of the vote on the rules and to me it would always again from my perspective it would be better to make sure it's vetted out and then if you have to continue that date of the proposed vote on the final rules that even if staff doesn't ultimately agree with that and gives us some reason or, you know, because it might not be that just more time mm -hmm. changes or makes any impact on the, on the staff's position. But at least then it's a lot easier to come and say, well, we had another opportunity to do that. So um, I know next week is December 10th. But given what you've said, it helps me. I, I wouldn't have understood that if I didn't, if I wasn't sitting in here. I wouldn't have understood this. So my thought would be to maybe Robin, if you might want to see, and it could be that you all could meet, and that what it won't change the December 10th date at all. But it seems to me like it would be optimal. I don't know that you need to call it another technical conference. I think you all can just get together and see how have a little more discussion and make sure everybody's kind of in an understanding. So that, that would be my suggestion. Again, I'm a, I can only speak for myself, but I mean, would that be helpful? I know Candace is here too. Would that be helpful? Okay. So it, it seems like I guess that would be my suggestion is that there be another meeting and I don't think it has to be framed as a posted technical conference. I think you all can just get together. So, Robin, whoever you think is appropriate, that'd be my suggestion. It looks like there's agreement from people that are here that they would like that. Thank are those you. just the, are those the two rules for this issue or you were just giving me two examples and there's more? I was giving you the two examples and I would say that How many would you say there are like I, what you're talking about? I, I'm, I'm not proposing that there's any more than what we've already addressed in the OPMCA comments but as far but as more, what rules are open. Right, but it's more than two that you're saying that 
appear to be more strict or are more strict in your opinion than the EPA and those are listed in these comments. So now that statement I can't agree with. I think that we have many rules that we have adopted that are more stringent than the EPA that I would question. Um, the but you're just talking about, you know, this, the, the way I see it, you can only start where you are. Right. You can't go back and right. really fix things. So to me, I'm just looking at where are we, and, and I was just trying to understand in the comments made today for the rules that are open today, you gave two examples. Are there any more examples in all of these comments more than those two? I can't answer that question without going through these, but the okay. comments that we provided for um, through OPMCA address several other issues that are more stringent than EPA besides uh, tank labeling. Um, the issue that, you know, just as I'm standing here looking at it, the tank and line test uh, that fails, they withdrew that. That was one that was more stringent. Um, I am not familiar and... Um, you, you've answered my question, okay. Terry, so I, okay. I get it. I was just trying to understand. There was a lot of comments, and I was just trying to understand if there was more than two of those. That's all I was trying to... And, and you don't know, so I appreciate you telling okay. me that. Thank you. Uh -huh. Commissioner, we do have um, eight rules where we're more stringent than EPA, and mm -hmm. those were submitted to EPA prior to our state program approval. Okay, so are you saying that the ones that are more stringent than EPA, that that was one of the reasons that EPA gave us the accreditation because we did that? Or you're saying that that's part of our anchor for getting it? Or what are you saying? No, we just had to identify those so they are aware and they still okay. approved our program. Okay. So our approval of our program wasn't contingent on being more strict, right? But it was just a part of it. Okay. Right. I understand that. Okay. So... Um, I think if it's just important if you all have another discussion and, you know, I think you, you all, have, I mean, I got to commend the staff. I mean, I, I know, Robin, you made a lot of effort to have meetings and get input, and I really am very appreciative of that. So, you know, certainly no criticism on my end, but if there's still some issues remaining, and the whole point of rules is to have discussion to me and, and to see what you can agree on, and then sometimes you can't agree and we have to make a decision, but I'd just like to know that, you made the effort to see if there's if there's something that can be done, just being very cognizant of um, based on what we're seeing, I, I just I think some times are going to get tougher for a lot of petroleum marketers in addition to oil and gas and other people. I, it's it's here. I've mentioned it for numerous months. things were going to be challenged, and they're revealing themselves now. So I think it'll have a trickle down effect. So I, I think if the staff will, I think if you all just try to meet with them and see if you can reach any agreements. But I think it would be helpful, Terry, if you would put your specifics in writing so that we could see them, that would be helpful. This is Kevin Nickel with Loves again. And again, I, one of the things that Terry brought up, you know, talking about some of the things that are well, way more uh, restrictive than, than federal guidelines. Again, it goes back to the double wall portion on the the remote field that we talked about earlier. Again, it's <clears throat> it's not it's it's there's only about four states that do that. California being one of them. I don't think anybody wants to be like California, but. Uh, there's, there's just a handful of them out there. There is a big cost to that, to putting another another sump in. You know, you're talking about another, at that point with, a, with the multi-ports like we talked about, Justin, you're talking about eight grand right there, just with a multi-port. Um, then you're talking about the monitoring that you have to do on that. So just, you know, it's something that I think we, we, we may have jumped into and looked at without I'm not disagreeing that we have had some releases due to uh, remote fields. I'm not disagreeing with that at all. But in the grand scheme of things, it may not be as much as what we thought. We, I don't know if we got a true study on that. I don't know. I don't think anybody does. Um, but just, just you know, letting y'all know that, that that will come with a big price tag. 
So. So is that so? That's along with um, along the lines of what Terry was speaking about. Absolutely. So do you think it would be helpful to just have another meeting with the staff? I I don't know if it, it you know personally. I mean, I just I was just hoping that people would would have you know look you know had that in mind whenever they're putting these rules together, going, hey, how big of an impact is this really going to ha ha help? And how, you know, how many dollars are we spending out in the fund? So you're really talking about the cost relative yeah, it, to the benefit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And again, you know, it's it's one of those deals where if, we, if we're going to do that, so be it. Yeah, but there's not very many states that do it. Um, not very many at all. So with that being said, I mean, if, if, I just wanted to bring that out and out into the open. I think it would be helpful, again, if you might meet with um, Justin or the okay. staff, because I, I don't know what the, I don't, I don't think, I don't know, and I'm probably the other commissioners don't know what the data is related to the, uh, the spills or, or leakage or whatever occurred, and what I mean, what we're trying to, unless you come and speak to us, I mean, like this, yes, ma'am, and sp we, I, you know, I wouldn't know this, so that helps me understand the cost. Right. Of what it would, because you, because if you're a loves or you're a major chain, you're going to have a lot of those to put in, right? Mm -hmm. Well, any any site that we retrofit in with that, mm -hmm. or any new site that we build, would most likely have one. Okay. So, you know, that ups our cost again. You know, that's it is it is part of business, but at the same time, it's you know, it's one of the one of the few states that require it, so. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I appreciate you speaking uh, okay. today. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? And uh, we will um, be in touch after this meeting uh, to try to set up a time to meet this week um, with anyone that's interested. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming out. Next meeting concerning these rules, next official meeting, will be the public hearing on Tuesday, December 10th at 9.30. And uh, we hope you'll come out for that as well. And I thank just want to thank the staff for uh, taking some extra time to meet with the people who also took the time to come here today and speak up. So I, I think the uh, nice job on moving through the rules, but if we need to take a little more time. I'm not saying we need to change the December 10th date, but um, that's just the day. And sometimes those, we've got plenty of time. So if you all need more time, take more time. If not, go with what we've got. Thank you. Thank you.